Okay, so Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Jesus said, And he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now that, that's a big statement. We're going to uh, take some time uh, breaking that statement down. But notice the, the thing that he said about the bread. I'm just going to simulate this. He broke the bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And that's, that's a full-size loaf of bread right there. Okay, so he broke the bread. And then he distributed it to his disciples at the table. Hallelujah. Now, so we, we have a, a simulation of, of uh, the cup here. It might not have looked exactly like that. The bread was probably flat. You know, cultural adaptation. Hallelujah. But Jesus was inviting his disciples to a covenant meal or actually inviting them into a covenant that would be observed by participating in this covenant meal. Okay? Now, there's a lot of layers to this. But I, I'm going to show you today in this message how uh, people can miss the message by hearing the wrong message and not seeing it and hearing it for what it is. So when Jesus made this statement to his disciples, it was based upon something that he had already been talking to them about, okay? And it also, uh, he'd, he'd been talking to them about it. Uh, you had to understand then, and this was 2,000 years ago, but you had to understand then the nature of a covenant meal to get the picture. So he took some time to explain that to his disciples. How many of you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay. Now the word disciple means disciplined one. So if you're a disciple of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, then that means you're a disciplined one of him, which means that you will be taught by him. Now we have a lot of things to learn. How many of you are willing to admit that you have a lot of things to learn? Okay. How many of you want your prayer life and your relationship with God to improve, to go up? Amen. Get a hold of the things of God. Actually be able to get your prayers answered with uh, confidence in knowing that it's done and walk away re expecting something to happen. See, that, that's actually what faith is. Okay, so Jesus' disciples, when he sat down that night with them, uh, they had been going through the motions of this covenant meal uh, as a part of their Passover observance for hundreds of years. But nobody had ever sat on the other side of the table and offered covenant, it's like an invitation, a covenant invite. So Jesus was actually inviting his disciples into a level of relationship and they understood exactly what he was talking about. He, he had explained it to them. Hallelujah. God is good. Okay, now, so like I said, there's a lot of layers to this. That, that's a certain level of symbology, if you will. Okay. Uh, praise God. Here's some of the, like today's language, here's some of the takeaways. Okay. The new covenant is a blood covenant. What in the world does that mean? Let's keep going. A blood covenant is a covenant which is secured by people's lives. Okay. Now, so first of all, a covenant is a, an agreement between two parties. It can be between nations. It can be between individuals. It can be between groups of people. Okay, but people come together to, to actually form a covenant. 
it's going to have terms, precepts, and then the parties that are going to enter into the covenant are going to, um, well, they're going to have to sign something or, or participate in some way. In a blood covenant, it's participate with your life. Now, as, as it turns out, the, the book of Leviticus tells us that life is in the blood. Okay, so what, what, the life of the flesh is in the blood. What in the world does that mean? Uh, well, if you take your blood out of your body, it's dead. So literally, life accesses the entirety of your body through the blood. Okay, now, so because life, which also means spirit, is in the blood. When you uh, bind an agreement with blood, you're saying... I'm binding this with my life. Now, you participate in an economic system in the world today on the basis of your integrity, your name. Every time you buy something, do something, participate in any way, it's all based on your name. Often we uh, deal with people on a basis, in commerce on a basis of what's your name like at the bank which is the reason why credit is such a big deal. You know, and the book of Proverbs tells us if your name is bad, then it, it's a bad thing for you. So a lot of what happens in the culture that we live in is all about our name. Well, it, with God, it's identical. It's all about his name. But he has to set the record straight about his name Okay, because the enemy has maligned God to mankind. That's what the devil does. Praise the Lord. And so when you accept God's promises, you're accepting his credibility. Which is what Abraham did when God first started talking to him. So Abraham received, a, just to go through that for a minute, uh, Abraham heard a promise from God. This is recorded in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham believed the promise, which means his faith was involved, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But by the time you get to Genesis chapter 15, God had already made good on a big part of the promise. But Abraham said, you know what? I still don't have an heir. I don't have a child to pass this covenant to. It wasn't just his possessions. It was a covenant that he had to pass down. And, and he didn't have an heir. Now, he had people in his house that, you know, uh, other relatives and so forth that he could pass things to. But that wasn't the promise. So Abraham called God on the covenant. And said, how do I know that you're going to do this? Now, he was already really blessed financially. That part of the covenant had already been made good and was working. But the seed part was yet to come. So God said, all right, I'll make a covenant with you. This is covenant language. I'm, I'm paraphrasing it for you a, a bit. Uh, Genesis chapter 15 God said, well, get me a ram, get me an ox. And he laid out the precepts of that day for a blood covenant. And then God entered into a blood covenant with a man. Hallelujah. This, this is big. You know, we're not going to be able to cover all this in, in one message. Okay. So God made a blood covenant because Abraham asked for security. How do I know a guarantee? Are you willing to sign to that? And so God said, okay, I'll go you one better. We'll make it a blood covenant. Which means this thing, this thing is secured in my blood it will eventually be secured in the blood of man. And when a blood covenant, 
is two parties shedding their blood into a, it's called a cup of mingling, and then drinking it. Now, in our culture, that sounds gross, but, you know, uh, thousands of years ago, that was the way, instead of signing your name, if you were entering into an agreement that had to be secured, you were going to do it with your blood. Hallelujah. Now, when I was a kid, you know, we used to play with this in the neighborhood. We called it blood brothers. You know, so we, we would cut our hand and shake hands. And, you know, what were we doing? We were mingling blood. That's exactly right. So we were mingling lies, which, I mean, we were just stupid, of course. Uh, we had, I had no idea, you know, what that meant, but it was just like, we won't come into your neighborhood if you won't come into our neighborhood. I mean, that, that's what that was. Are you there? But see, this covenant procedure is something that you're already familiar with. You're operating in it on a daily basis. When you leave here today, you're probably going to go and use your name to do something, probably eat out. And so there has to be security to your name. Otherwise, your name is no good. You can't use your name to do anything. But if you have a good name, you can actually use your name in commerce without even having to actually have the stuff. It's your name that stands for you. Are you there? Okay, so everybody knows what that is. That's what a covenant is. When you buy a house in a neighborhood, you might not know this, but real estate agents know this. Uh, there's uh, restrictive covenants and covenants for neighborhoods that are all written into the laws which control the property. Amen. So restrictive covenants or just covenants, the covenants of the, of the property. You probably live in a neighborhood that, that has covenant agreements that are registered in the county, the city, for that particular district. And that, that's what actually, those agreements is what holds the neighborhood together. It's at, the, it's at the base of the law. How many of you are with this? So what God is saying is, I want to enter into a covenant with you. So he proposed the whole thing to Abraham. Okay, you want a guarantee? Let's make it a blood covenant. Hallelujah. Now, how many of you are getting something out of this? So the blood covenant that God proposed, uh, the original part, the promise part. See, he made a promise, but then Abraham asked for more. And God said, okay, I'll seal it with my oath. The word oath became a part of the terminology. Oath in Hebrew is blood covenant. Translates into the new covenant the same way. Are you there? So God swore an oath, which meant that he would shed his own blood. Now, the, the, the problem is with God entering into a blood covenant, he didn't have a body. Abraham had blood, but he didn't ask for Abraham to shed his blood. So God entered into a unilateral blood covenant with Abraham based upon his own integrity, his name, that God would make his name good, which he did. So when Jesus came, Jesus is God's body. Oh, come on now. Are you, uh, we're we're going to read that in the book of Hebrews. Are, are you with us? So God, when he made the promise, what was outstanding in, in the covenant was God didn't have any blood. Told you there was a lot of layers. So Abraham accepted God's word and the covenant moved forward well enough for Jesus to be born. Jesus is God's lamb. 
He's, he's also God's body. So when Jesus sat down at the table, I mean, this is deep. Are you out there? When Jesus sat down at the table that night with his disciples, he, he assumed God's side of the covenant as being the, the God now had a body. See, this is what you believed in when you accepted Jesus. Are you out there? You might not have known that. I had no idea this is what I believed. When I accepted Jesus, all I did was ask for help. Help! Probably a lot like you. Hallelujah. But what you were actually doing is you, you were adding your faith to this covenant working. It's still working. And as you can see, where it started way back there with Abraham, there's been a progression. Things have been added. Things have been deleted. God took the law of Moses out of the covenant process. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Come on, can you say? Because Jesus fulfilled the law. Okay, but so Jesus sat down with them that night himself in God's place, he's the one now who had a body. God had a body. And so that's the reason why the next day at Calvary, when they shed his blood, when he said, it is finished, what was he talking about? God's promise was made complete, which fulfilled all the righteous claims of the law, Accomplished all those things, redeemed mankind, pray, paid for the, the sins of the entire world because God now had a body that he was willing to give in sacrifice. Fulfilling the covenant. Hey, amen. Can you say amen? How many of you got something out of that? Okay, so binding a covenant with blood is the equivalent of binding or swearing on your life. So this is the reason why the New Testament explains to us in great detail that because God's promises are secured in the new covenant by the blood of Jesus, there's no way that God can lie. You see, he did that on purpose. He bound himself with his own life that he would not and could not lie. So it is impossible for God to lie. The Bible tells us, are, are you there? Now, so because God is the creator of all things and all things are upheld by the word of his power, how can I tell the covenant's still working? Well, first of all, you're here. Everything that is created by the word that, that he created by the word is still here. Go outside and look up at the stars at night. That's your proof, testimony, that God's word is still working. Hallelujah. If God's word had failed at any point, just like what Jesus, Jesus is the one that said this, heaven and earth would pass away. Because if his word's no good, all things upheld by the word of his power, poof, it's all gone. So because it's all here, including you, that's testimony to the fact, now you have to believe these things. That's testimony to the fact that God's word is working. His word is working. All of these things that have been set in motion since before the foundation of the world, it's all working. Now remember, when God made the covenant with Abraham, Abraham, all he had to do was believe it. He was not required to participate in anything other than believing. Now eventually, God added some things. He added a, a seal or a sign on Abraham's side to the covenant of circumcision. Uh, he gave you know, some principles, and then eventually the Levitical law. And the, and the New Testament tells us that the law was added because of transgressions. 
till the seed should come to whom the promise was made because the book of Hebrews tells us the covenant that God made with Abraham was weak on one side. It was weak on man's side. See, because God start, you know, started a blood covenant. He used the blood of bulls and goats for his own blood temporarily. But it sealed the covenant. But there's no weakness on God's side. There's never a failure on God's side. But on Abraham's side, read it for yourself. There's a number of failures. Abraham and his seed so that by the time the nation of Israel were being led out of Egypt, God said, okay, we're, we, we, they called on the covenant. Remember the nation of Israel in Egypt, they started calling on the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which meant God was obligated to honor his promises. Part of the promise, whew, we're getting, getting somewhere here today. Are you getting something out of this? Part of the promise was the land. Okay, so they were living in bondage. They weren't living in the land that is promised in Genesis chapter 15. So when they started calling on the covenant, God said, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make good that side of the contract. So he led them out. <laughs> you know, it is, here's the amazing, it, there, there are no obstacles that can on earth or anywhere that can stand in the way of God bringing his word to pass. I mean, the Red Sea's parting, all, you know, p pillars of fire, all these things are happening. All part of fulfilling the promise that he made in Genesis chapter 15. Now, <laughs> you read the book of Revelation, it shows you a bunch of promises yet to be fulfilled and the changing of the heavens the defeat of the Antichrist and, and the enemies of God, the, the placing of the nation of Israel in the promised land. Ooh, just exactly like he said. It's going to happen exactly like he said. It's already happened all along the way exactly like he said. So you and I, see, we actually got into the contract on Abraham's side. Okay, now, now we're going to add some elements as we go forward because uh, Jesus actually kind of played a dual role. Okay, but we, we'll dial that in. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay, uh, but if you would go with me over to John chapter 6, I want to show you in your own Bible where Jesus explained to his disciples the thing about his body and his blood. Okay? John chapter 6. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, got, I, I went so far ahead, I've got blown our time window. I'm just being honest with you. So I, I'm going to highlight it, and then we'll come back to it and, and embellish it. But, but let me show you the walk away. Okay? So Jesus was challenged by the scribes and Pharisees about his integrity. He went through this big thing of explanation with them. This all happened in Capernaum. Okay, and he explained it all to them, but they didn't get it. So then they challenged him even further, and he said, Look, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have any part in me. Now, they were all scholars. They should have known what he was talking about. You know, they, oh, who, you know eat his flesh and drink his blood? That, you know, that's, that's called dumb for a scholar to act like that. Because he was talking in covenant language. Eat my flesh and drink my blood is another way of saying you're going to have to enter into covenant with me in order to have any life in you. And he talked about eternal life. He said, I'm the living bread. 
Glory to God, are you there? But there was a religious walkout. A religious walkout? Yeah. Seen many religious walkouts in my day. So in other words, you get to a place where you know, people are following, but they're not actually following. Look at verse 66. Well, back up to verse 60. I'll read three verses to you. He said, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, this was all in Capernaum, it says in verse 59, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? In other words, they didn't get it that it was covenant language. Okay, his, his disciples probably didn't understand it either. But, but look at their response. Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, and he said, does this offend you? And he went on to verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now, Peter and, and, Jan, and, and all of them, they were uneducated. So Jesus turned, they, they, they had no idea what he was talking about. But when he turned to his disciples, he said, well, are you going to go away too? And Peter said, well, where would we go? You have the words of life. In other words, we already believe you. Whatever you say is the way it's going to be. That's a covenant. That's resignation of belief. I don't need any proof. You know, people pull out all these things about proof of Calvary. I, I don't need the proof. I've got the word. I don't need to see a thing. I believe it already. Glory to God. God is good. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Praise the name of Jesus. Woo, yeah. Now, we, we ran ahead, you know, so we're going to do a lot of explaining as we go. There's many, many layers to this. But this is the actual foundation of our faith. This is what makes the covenants work. Glory to God. Okay. So, if you have something in your life that you feel like is standing between you and the Lord, now, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, but it, you say, I would like to get any barric uh, uh, barricades or obstacles out of my way this morning. If I'm talking to you, I want to ask you to raise your hand. Thank you. Praise the Lord. God is good. Okay, so by raising your hand, what you're doing is calling on the covenant. See, this is what prayer for a believer is. We're calling on the covenant, just like the nation of Israel in bondage. If you got trouble in your life, it's not supposed to be there because he, he's covered it with promises. So let's ask him. That's what he said. Just ask. Just ask. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, I ask you to eliminate trouble out of my life and bring peace to my heart back again. I know that you're able. I know that you're willing because you've already promised it. So I'm calling on the covenant in the name of Jesus as of today. I consider all trouble in my life to be gone. In Jesus' name. Ooh, hallelujah. God is good.